How does one gain the protection of Allah and how does one enter into the protection of Allah? Whether it's against the shayateen, evil spirits or from the corruption that we're surrounded by in today's world. Joining us today is a notable and prominent speaker from North London, Sheikh Hassan Ali, the founding director of Safar Academy and Publications. Welcome and thank you for joining us. How are you going? Zaqun khair. Assalamu alaikum and to all the viewers as well. I don't know if people at home may recognize you, but mashallah, there's uh, the now famous Dhikr video of yourself. That's uh, There's a one hour and I think there's a 10 hour edition as well. Mashallah, I've been playing in my house for mm. quite a long time. Very beautiful. Beautiful video. That, that, that was for ta'aleem purposes. That was just to um, get people to know how to do maybe one form of dhikr but everyone's free to do whatever dhikr they want to whichever they whichever way they want to because uh, dhikr is something when you do it you develop your own own style on tune mm -hmm. and everyone should really you know be encouraged to do that yeah. it was a beautiful video even from a production perspective as someone who's really in tune with editors, cameras and yeah. the lighting it was done very, well, very done. well very nicely the audio the lighting was was beautiful and as you said it did bring that peace and that serenity Sakina. upon the viewers. The Sakina subhanallah. Sheikh, if we can just get started in terms of the definition of the protection of Allah. What does it mean to be someone who is protected by Allah? And what is the protection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? So the protection of Allah Azza wa Jal is look first we have to understand is that Allah is Qadir ala kulli shay. He has power over everything. So in Islam, we believe that evil has absolute zero power against God because evil itself was allowed to be what it is because of the hukum of Allah. So Allah has created khair, goodness, and he gave evil a chance to exist. So the entire evil, 100% is within the control of Allah. And Allah has all power. Nothing besides him has any power unless he gives it that power. So that's the basis, the first, because the, there are other religions that be, believe that evil has got some kind of equivalent power to God, which we don't believe. Okay. So then what it is that if, if, if there's evil around us, there's evil within us as well. And Allah, for, for the protection means that Allah then stops that evil from reaching you, from affecting you from making you go astray or for making you, you know, have any, be influenced in any way f by that evil, Allah stops that. So that, that's what the meaning protection of protection of Allah, of, of Allah the is. The wiqaya of Allah, to have yes. that protection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Does so, this, I know we had asked a leading question onto that, Sheikh. Is that, does that, can that take a form in, to get protection, this divine protection that we're talking about, does that take a specific form? I know nowadays, you know, you see, you go to the markets and there's, you know, the little blue eye that's selling <laughs> over there. So what does divine protection look like? Is it a recitation or is it a physical thing? Look, the thing is, when we read the Quran, what's the first thing we, we read? In the beginning of Baqarah, oh, I'm saying. Yes, yes. In the beginning of Baqarah, Alladheena yu'minuna bil ghaib. Why did Allah make us read that in the beginning? That these are the people who believe, like the believers and the people who have taqwa, they are the people Allah describes them. The first quality they have is that their belief in the unseen. So we as Muslims, we believe in a massive unseen world. Yeah. Okay, so Allah is in the unseen world. The malaika, the angels are in the unseen world. There's the, the whole, uh, the, the whole, there's a system that's all around us. We don't see the, the two angels sitting here right now. They're in the unseen world. Every human that is born gets one devil and one angel appointed to them. That's in the unseen world. So when we get bad thoughts, it's coming from the devil. When you're getting good thoughts, it's coming from the angel within the qareen, us. Would you call it the Qareen? Some has described, described as mm -hmm. the Qareen. But the, the, the thing is here is that the protection that we get is all in the ghaib. It's in the unseen world. So if I'm protected, I could be sitting here. I don't see anything moving physically around me. But there's an unseen protection around me which Allah gives. Mm -hmm. Now that could be like in certain ahadith, it's mentioned that if you read Ayat al-Kursi, uh, before you go to sleep, then there's going to be an angel appointed 
to protect you throughout the night. Yeah. So now I'm sleeping here, I don't see the angel, and I don't need to see anything physical in front of me. But that angel is there to ward off any evil that comes towards me. Yeah. I like that there are so many, like the, the famous uh, hadith of um, hadith in Bukhari, where now, now we go into a physical protection. Let me give you one example of physical protection. So Abu Hurairah is in charge of the, the Malu Ghanima. And you know, there, there, there's the booty the, uh, that he's in charge of to look after it. And then um, uh, a thief comes and tries to steal from it. And uh, uh, Abu Hurairah grabs hold of him and, and says, I'm going to take you to the Prophet Sallallahu And he says, don't, 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 I won't come back again. Yeah. The second day, the exact same, the second night, the exact same thing happens again. He grabs hold of him and, and he says, please, just let me go. I won't come back again. The third night, he says, no. Today, there's no letting go. So he drags him and he said, look, I'll teach you something. If you say it, you'll never have your, your uh, possession ever stolen. If you read this, he says, what is that? And he said, read Al Kursi. Mm-hmm. Right? So then Abu, Abu, Abu Hurairah went to the Prophet and narrated all of that. And the Prophet said, he described it. He said, he said, this man came and he gave the description. And the Prophet said, Sadaq al Kadhub, the one who lies a lot on this occasion, told the truth. And then, and then he said, that was Shaitan. Right? And the hadith of Bukhari. And what we find here is that the hadith is teaching us you want to protect wealth. So you read Al Kursi, and your wealth, uh, physical wealth, is protected from the devil because you, you read it. SubhanAllah. So these are the various means. So I guess reciting Ayatul Kursi is a means of protecting yourself. What are the other means as a Muslim can. So, 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 this, so this Ayatul Kursi is, is just one form. The main form of protection that we gain from Allah Azza wa Jal is that we have to do our salah. A lot of Muslims don't understand this. A lot of Muslims are like, you know, there's a jinn, there's sihr, there's evil eye. So I've got to go to someone, choo-choo-choo-choo. And then after that, you know, I'm, I'm protected. But they're not doing their salah. So what is salah? Salah is that I am now uh, standing in front of Allah and I'm remembering Him. So I'm saying Allah, first I'm obeying Him. So that obedience, and the obedience is loyalty. In exchange of the loyalty, there is a relationship that Allah forms with, that Allah allows me to, to be close to Him. And in that, what it is, is the major thing, which a lot of people think dhikr is when you've got a sibha in your hand or when you're doing it on your fingers, they think that's dhikr. Dhikr is in every single form of worship we have. So in salah, we're told, Allah said in the Surah Taha, wa aqim salata li dhikri. Establish your prayers to remember me. The Quran says, Inna salata tanha an fahsha'i wal munka. The salah will save you from evil and from obscenity. But then Allah says, Wala dhikrullahi akbar. In that ayah in Surah number 29, ayah number 45, Allah says, Wala dhikrullahi akbar. The, 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 dhikr of, the remembrance of Allah is greater. Why? Because the dhikr in salah is the, the greatest thing that I will have. So when you when I'm thinking of Allah, Allah is watching me, Allah is watching me, and I'm saying Allahu Akbar, Subhanak Allah, and Surah Fatiha, and Ruku, and Sujood, I'm the thinking of Allah. Whole salah is dhikr. The whole salah is dhikr, from the beginning to the end. Allahu Akbar is dhikr. That's yeah. it. For all the way to salam alaykum, mm-hmm. is a dhikr. Now that dhikr that I've just done, is, it gets me the ma'iyya with Allah. It's the, it's the, to be with Allah. Because Allah has said, فَذْكُرُونِي أَذْكُرْكُمْ You remember me, I'll remember you. Which means, and the ulama have said, what does it mean that Allah remembers? Because Allah always knows us. So mm-hmm. he never forgets us. So what does it mean that he remembers? It means Allah will now give you a specific and a special attention. Mm-hmm. Right? And that is now, that is the form, that, that is the basis of the form of protection we have is the five daily prayers. Mm-hmm. What a relationship right? to build. How, mm-hmm. how beautiful. That's right. So, so, so in that, the khushu and the devotion we have is a huge element of getting this, this protection. Because... If, if you are thinking of Allah, uh, you know, th- th- there's many ayats that say the forgetfulness that we have, the, the time we forget Allah, Allah then makes us forget ourselves. So, la takunu kalladheena nasullaha fa'ansahum anfusahum. You know, the, the Quran has said very clearly that don't become of those people that they've abandoned Allah, they've forgotten Allah, but then Allah makes them forget themselves. So there's no sort of ta'allu, there's no, there's no relationship here. So if you want to build that relationship, you start doing your salah first thing. And then on top of that is the, the big protection we get is the actual recitation of the Quran in Arabic. Now that recitation of the Quran in Arabic is probably the biggest protection we have after salah against all these, the, 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 uh, the, the sihr, the, the black magic, the jinns, the, you know, the, the other evils that are there. Because what, what, why is this a protection? Right? This is a question. It's because 
When I'm reciting the Quran, I'm repeating the exact words that Allah said. Now, Allah is the powerful one. His words are superior and above every other word. So when his word is mentioned and a word of sihr and black magic is mentioned, what's going to happen? Kalamullah is the, uh, the absolute superior. Of As Kalimatullah yeah. yeah, right? the, the, the word of Allah is the most supreme. Mm. There's nothing that can stay in front of Allah. Now, now, there's one thing though here, which is everyone reads the Quran, but not everyone gets the same protection. Why is that? Because for that to work, I've got to have the connection with Allah. Yeah. Right? So there, there can be a person who doesn't practice Islam and he's now reading the Quran for protection. It won't be as effective as a person who's practicing Islam and reading the Quran. Why? Because the person who's practicing Islam, they've made a connection with Allah. That Ma'iyah explained, that is there. And that's why then Allah then makes his words be effective. His words are always effective. But in this case, he's going to make it effective. In that case, he himself decides not to make it effective. Because of that connection. If you've got connection with him, it works. It's an absolute mindset to have as a believer that I am in the protection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from the morning. You know, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, Look, man salla subh, fahuwa fi dhimmatillah. Mm -hmm. You know, you, you pray the subh, the fajr prayer, you're in the protection of Allah. And just to have that confidence that, hey, you know, there's, I'm surrounded by evil, I'm surrounded by corruption, I'm surrounded by all these things, but I'm in the protection of Allah. As you said, the ma'iyya, I'm with Allah. And to have that closeness with Allah, proximity, yeah. the proximity to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in a world, like, let's face it, we're like a speck in the universe, a speck in the galaxy. The earth compared to the sun, what is it? It's like a speck. When you realize how weak you are as a human being and how fragile and how small and insignificant we are in the realm of the cosmos, you're like, alhamdulillah, I, I have the greatest yeah, power but, with yeah. me. So we are in seven England, but when you're using the kalam Allah, when you're saying Allah's words, when I'm, when I'm doing this salah and I'm following what Rasulullah taught me, because Rasulullah taught me everything that Allah taught him, right? Mm -hmm. So when I'm doing the salah, I'm reading Surah Fatih, I'm doing the ruku exactly as Rasulullah did it. I am now doing what the master, the Malikul Muluk, the king of kings said it. So who's who in front of the king of kings? So you being such an insignificant person become so great in the sight of Allah because of the, the words that are Allah's words and the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi words. That's what makes you great. Rahmatullah uh, Ali, Muhammad Ali. Yeah. They said, why don't you have a bodyguard? He goes, Allah, yeah. I have Allah. You know, you could spend all this money on security, on armies, on everything. At the end of the day, you have Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Malik al-Muluk, as you mentioned, the king of all kings. Sheikh, you mentioned something that I want to touch on about um, forgetfulness. And we live in such a day and age where, of course, we have so many distractions. Uh, let's not forget, we all have this weapon that's in the side yeah. of our pockets, this weapon phone that we have. If we really think about it, you have you have the power to destroy someone's career, let's say with a tweet nowadays but um especially with the rise of social media now we've got to look at apps like uh tiktok which guiltily we are on but alhamdulillah we're trying to change the the ecosphere <laughs> over there um but my question would be to you how can we protect our our families our friends our spouses even from the evil eye given that we're now living in an age of social media the eyes are eyes are everywhere you can't hide it you know you have like big brothers always watching you with security cameras the mobile phone we, we have, have cameras watching one us two right now. three over here on us at the moment but it's such an interesting peculiar and somewhat of a dangerous time that we're living now i think you would have to agree the eyes are always on us whether we know knowingly or unknowingly but how do we protect ourselves when we all have this craving nowadays that we just want to be seen and heard just funnily enough, people just have that uh, feeling. The, the first thing is that they call it the smartphone. The smartphone, yeah. But if you get addicted to it. Now you're a user. Then if you get addicted to it, then you're no longer smarter than the smartphone. <laughs> yeah. so, so you have to become a person, first of all, that becomes smarter than the smartphone. The smartphone itself. The, then now you're above it. Okay. Otherwise, you're, you're a slave to the, to, the, to the technology that's around us. And a lot of us... You know, when, when we can't put it down, when that thing causes you anxiety, mm -hmm. when that thing pulls, it, it controls your life and it demands that I've got to put a photo up there, I've got to put something else. You, you're not being as smart as a smartphone. So, so let's not fool ourselves mm -hmm. first. Second thing is that, uh, yes, we've got all these uh, cameras and everything around us, but the human shouldn't forget his place on the earth. Mm -hmm. The human's place is more in the offline world 
than the online world. Disconnecting to connect, right. if you can, so right. to speak. So, so when you're spending real time with a human without cameras, without anything, without any recording devices, um, it's your real self. See, most of these people that are taking images, they become their unreal self at that moment in the imagery process. So you look at anyone on Instagram, on TikTok, they, 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 call, they got this thing called the perfect Instagram photo, right? So you've got to be in the perfect place with the perfect background, with a perfect smile. With a perfect filter. With a perfect filter. So Kamal's uh, right? on a private account. So and also sorry. the perfect phone because you've got phones with different lenses yeah, now, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? And then you take that picture, Triple but what lens. are you doing? You're, yeah. you're actually living an unreal moment because that's not your life. Right? You don't always have those things in the background. You probably don't even own half the things in, your, in the background. You don't have this face. And some people, I'll be honest with you, they, they take a photo, photo with a filter and look in the mirror and they think, nah, the one, the, the one that I took photo of, it looks better than me. Yeah. You know, right? They get depressed. Yeah. Right? So now look, you, 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 first thing is you're fooling yourself with the offline and the online world. Mm -hmm. right? Because they're two different worlds. Now in that online world, it's, it's another utopia that we've created where everyone, whoever posts anything up there, is going to be perfect. It's going to be really good. Mm -hmm. But you know what? Human life... Is not always, always perfect. perfect. Yeah. So now you're in a dilemma mm -hmm. because you're trying to live that life. You 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 have an ideal thing that you want to always be in that life. You want to show that life, but that is not the truth. The reality is you have sad moments. The reality is you never smile that much. As much as people are smiling on the cameras, they don't do it. The reality is we have faces that are the normal faces, and there's nothing wrong with the faces that we have. We should accept reality. The problem comes when you have made this ideal world. Yeah. And you're trying to live up to it. A bit you, of a fantasy, if you're right, so it's, it's a fantasy. And yeah. you're trying to get, you, you've entered a fast lane. Now imagine this, there's a motorway, right? With, uh, you call it highway, right? Highway, motorway with six lanes. Mm -hmm. You've entered that. Now once you enter that, each lane that you change, it gets faster and faster. And you better keep up with the speed. But if, if, you, if you can't keep up with the speed, there's going to be an accident. Yeah. Or you're going to feel very uncomfortable. My thing is, why enter that highway in the first place? Stick, stay, no, stay in your lane. Stay in your lane. So uh, f you, you're not supposed to put pictures up for uh, the whole world to see of you in a certain imagery. Because that, then the second problem that happens here is this. That let's say I showed all these photos, right? Yeah. And people say, oh, wow, wow, you know, this and that, right? Now, easily you can get the ayn, you can get the evil eye. Mm. Because not everyone's going to say, MashaAllah, and Barakallahu Feek, and you know, not everyone's going to say that. How many of your friends are really your friends or your followers? Yeah. You know, the, the world is such a world that if an accident, if an accident happened right now, I'm talking right now, I'm talking about, let's say you're in a railway station, an accident happened. I have to catch the train after this, Sheikh, so maybe. <laughs> right, no, I'm just saying that if the accident happened, as in, as in let's say, well, I'm not saying an accident with the, with, with the train crash now, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about, let's say you slipped, you fell off the platform, you know, somebody fell off the platform and they fell down. 90% of those people are gonna flip out, flip out their phones. Mm, start recording. And they're gonna start recording because they want the likes. Only a few might think, okay, let's go let's to that person, person, let's help him out, yeah. right? Same thing with all these accidents, bicycle accidents, this and that, people are just flipping phones out. So what, like what you just said now, who's your real friend? And what is this real world? So now the next thing is this, those people out there that they've seen all my images, they've got this perception that I'm always like this. Now I've got to always live up to that. So I've always got to have that, that, that you know, I've got, I've got to show them that I've got those expensive things, right? Now you've shifted another, another you know, get in, in, you've gone into another lane. And now you're making your own life really difficult. Why do all of that? So the way I, 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 I you know, I've lived my life and I, and I want to tell the viewers to live their life. Just live who you really are. Make life simple. And the evil eye, now, what people don't think of is you've posted that for your friends to see but that's open to the world to see mm -hmm. I sometimes feel so bad you know you, you, you show some food that you're having there are people starving across the world who are going to see those images how are they supposed to feel there are people who can't afford who can't they haven't even got a, a house of mud and you're showing a concrete house with this car and that thing and how is this supposed to, you know, how is this supposed to feel, right? And, and what we've got to be honest with ourselves is that much of evil eye is now being attracted to oneself through this imagery. Yeah, through social media. So you would say limit exposure. That might be a bit too hard for many people. No, what, I think you should be sensible, that's mm. all. Which is, which is, look, one thing I really need to say, look, 
throughout all these years, I've never taken an image of my child and put it onto social media. Why? Because first is they're innocent, they're young children. Second is there's a lot of eye or evil eye that can come straight through to whatever is beautiful, mm. right? And children are, are beautiful in general and people can give the evil eye. Mm. Next thing is that if I was to put my child into with me in, in one of those videos, uh, what does that do that to him? What does that do to that his ego? Is he ego? ready for such exposure? I see, is he mm. ready for such exposure? And what does that do that to, to, to his world? So people have to be careful what you're showing at. Okay, yes, we show a few things. Be sensible, be reasonable. You know, you don't get into this thing of every time I'm having something, yeah. I, gotta, I gotta share it. Yeah. Share the food, share the clothing, share the this, share this party, that thing, that, that. And people have made professions out of this stuff nowadays, right? Yeah. It's you've got bloggers, you've got food critics on Instagram and whatnot, it's quite interesting. What, now, this is a key question. What's the reason why they did that? Mm -hmm. The reason, if you really deep go deep down, the reason why they did that is to increase followers. Mm -hmm. Likes. And it could be and monetization. Followers. They could get money out of something right, like that. Right, that's the next stage. First is Business. likes and followers. Mm -hmm. And those likes and followers, they lead, lead to perhaps monetization. Or if anything, fame. Fame, attraction. These are the key things people are doing for. Now, where's our line this? So you know this thing we just spoke about, Maia. Mm -hmm. Where is that? Are these people doing it for Allah's sake? All these images, all these photos, all these things? But what if they're things? doing it for dunya, for the sake of the dunya? As in what? If they're doing like it Like they're doing it as a, as a business. I don't know, maybe we're going on onto a bit of a tangent. Oh yeah, go, go, go. Like go. if it's a business, khalas, like we'll just let them get their money. They're doing dunya, like they're trying to get their kasab for the, for the day. Okay, so, so yeah, so certain things, there are certain bloggers and influencers, whatever, they might, they might have a business and yeah. they want to show their products and so on. Fine, it's a business, mm -hmm. right? We're talking uh, about normal people, average people, making that online world a world where they must post something mm -hmm. because every, either they've, they've entered this fast lane mm -hmm. or they, they, they've, got, they've got to increase their followers, they've got to increase their you know, next number. Of, and then what happens is anxiety creeps in when those things don't come about. So when you don't have the followers you wanted, mm -hmm. when you don't have the likes, or people give you a mm -hmm. thumbs like, down. Well, they actually mm -hmm. removed it now from YouTube, so you, don't, okay. you can't dislike. Okay, okay, but I'm just, I'm just, let's say the definitely. followers leave you, uh, yeah. right? There's a whole there's a whole thing of young people being suicidal and again affected with anxiety because of that, because of that anyway. Yeah. And the saddest part is most of it is controlled by the algorithm. I remember people were getting like tons of likes. I think end of 2019, but then Mark Zuckerberg he tweaked the algorithm a little bit. He gave them less traffic, and all of a sudden they're getting nowhere near the amount of likes they were getting. And what does that result in? As you mentioned, depression, anxiety, sadness. Why haven't I got this? Why haven't I got this sizable following that I once used to have? I think a very important note to, to make on this topic of the evil eye is that while we are like probably speaking bad, not necessarily speaking bad of the people that give the evil eye, but you can very well have good intentions and still give someone yes, the evil yes, eye. Yes, yes, you can. Mm. You can. Because the thing is, uh, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa told us, Allah aynu haqq. Like that, the effect of the eye is a reality, it happens. And you don't have to necessarily, necessarily be evil to give the evil eye. You don't have to have evil intentions to give it. Uh, the Prophet ﷺ has told us that when you see something that impresses you, you should say, Barakallahu fiqh, or you should make dua of Allah putting blessing into that. There's some mechanism behind there, as ulama have described in very numerous different ways to try to describe it, but there's some mechanism behind that where if somebody doesn't make that dua or doesn't you know, have good, you know, doesn't say, may Allah put blessing into that thing, that it could be, if not always, but it could be affected with the evil eye. Yeah, and it's probably very interesting because the dua of the married couple, Barakallahu yeah. lakuma wa baraka alaykuma. You know, it's just immediately the Prophet Sallallahu told us to make this dua for barakah for the married couple because they are so prone to the evil eye yes, yes, on, yes. That, on that I, night I and in that yeah. moment. H have you noticed that, Sheikh? The, not just that, but there's, there's also when they have babies as well. Mm. You know, babies are innocent, right? But they're so cute. Yeah. Why would you want to put, in, you know, photos of your baby all over the internet or on your social media. I, I don't understand that. Just, just let them be. Let them be having innocence of life. So what you said now, right now, you're on the day of your wedding. You're looking the your best. best. The best. 
So you, you're prone to getting and the... And you've got a thousand people in attendance or maybe a hundred or, you know, yeah. depending but on it's, how... But it is really funny. I mean, like, we all want to be seen and heard to a degree. Perhaps people, perhaps in my age bracket, but the disease is a bit above that. But um, I think if you always want to be present with someone, you know, who would you rather be present more more than, than with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Like, mm. wherever you're going, you're always in the presence of one. Mm-hmm. So I think if we have that consciousness at the back of our head, perhaps we would be switching off our phones a bit more. But Sheikh, you mentioned about inviting this kind of evil into our homes. And I want to get a bit into this. And this is a bit of untouched territory for us on the One Path podcasts. The Sheikh, I think they have to get the cat out of the bag. Jinns. Okay. In the home. Okay. How do we warn off jinns from entering into our home? And um, how would you define jinn? Because a lot of people get confused between shaitan, jinns. And so if we can get some definitions and perhaps categorize the two, if we could. First thing is jinns are not bad. Not all jinns are bad, yes. That's a misconception, right? number so, one. So it's that first thing. Yeah. A lot of things that a lot of people think, oh my God, jinns. When they hear the word jinn, uh-huh. they're associated with the evil, evil. jinns. What yeah. is a jinn? I guess for our viewers that are unfamiliar. So a jinn, jinn, the word jinn has been mentioned in the Quran. They are a species Allah created that are in the unseen world from our eyes. They see us, but we don't see them. And they've been here on the earth longer than us, right? And they're all around us. They're around wherever they are. But there's two categories, primarily two categories. They are the, there are the jinns who are believers. Jinn who are mu'minun. And they've been even mentioned in Surah Jinn, the 72nd chapter of the Quran. And then there are the jinn who are the rebellious jinn. So they have now, they're not in the, dis, in, they're not in the obedience of Allah. They're disobedient. So they are known as shayateen. They are jinns their other name is shayateen or shaitan or devils that's that's the word we give to them right so they're mischievous but the same thing is amongst humans humans are also categorized in two categories you've got good humans you've got humans with evil intent mm-hmm. and the surah nas yeah. s- uh, captures it by saying minal jinnati wan nas the shaitan alladhi yuwasus fi sudur nas allah says minal jinnati wan nas he exists or she exists from amongst the jinn and from amongst humankind. Okay, so both are there. Okay, that, that's the primary thing. Next thing is, look, if I've got a good jinn now, would I want to get rid of that good jinn? Why, why, would, why would I get rid of a good jinn? If a good jinn is around, if they're, if they're somewhere, alhamdulillah, they're, they're a believer, they're not going to harm me. In fact, they'll probably be good. Their presence is probably going to be good because they're going to be reading Quran. They'll be doing their own salah. They'll be, so certain Muslim homes, they have good jinns. Those good jinns never bother you. In fact, their presence in your house is probably going to ward off the bad jinns from coming in. Right? So people, people shouldn't be freaked out with, with jinn jinn because there are, there are certain good jinns that we have around us. Yeah. Right? So now let's go to the bad jinns, the, the evil one, the one with the bad evil intent. Rasulullah has given us a number of things to protect ourselves against them. Uh, so he's told us when you come to the house, just saying Bismillah. Right? That is... That, that is, so if a jinn is following you, if a jinn wants to get into your house, you said Bismillah, now they can't come in. Yeah. That's an automatic. Won't enter. Yeah, they can't enter. If you've got a window, you open the window or a door or something, you say Bismillah when you open it. No jinn can come in. If you close, you say Bismillah, no jinn can enter. If you've got a, he's even said about the, the, the food pots that we've got. Mm-hmm. You say Bismillah and then you cover it. So no jinn can ever go and taste anything from there. Right? So in every single thing, Bismillah is actually a massive protection against jinns. In the name of Allah. He said, even told us, it means in the name of Allah. So he even told us when you're taking your clothes off, right? Let's say I'm in my private home. I'm taking my clothes off. He says, say Bismillah. If you say Bismillah and you take them off, no jinn can see you. He's told us when we go to the toilet, we say Bismillah, Allahumma inni a'udhu bika min al khubuthi wal khaba'ith. Now, what's, what are we saying there? We're saying in the name of Allah, Bismillah. Allahumma, oh Allah, inni a'udhu bika. I'm seeking your protection. Seeking your protection from what? Khubuth wal khabaith. From the male uh, sort of evil jinns and from the female evil jinns, I'm seeking your protection from that. So we say that because uh, the thing is, uh, you know, at that moment, obviously, you're going, you know, to relieve yourself, but you don't want any jinns to come. So Allah gives you that protection automatically. Now, furthermore than that is, in my house, if I've got the Quran being recited, especially in Arabic, with tilawa, with you know, when I'm reciting the Quran. Now again, when I say, why am I saying this Arabic, Arabic? Because we've now entered a new age 
where of course it's very important that we know the meaning of the Quran. Nobody's saying that we shouldn't know the meaning of the Quran. It's very important that we read the translation of the Quran, we read the tafsir of the Quran, and we know what Allah is telling us. Yes, but the Arabic is the, the Arabic is Allah's words, not the English. So if I'm saying that is the book, there is no doubt in it, which is al Kitabu La Fi. Those words, that is the book, there's no doubt in it. Allah never said it like that. Allah said, al Kitabu La Fi. These are the words Allah said to Jibreel. Jibreel gave to Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave to Sahaba. Sahaba, you know, passed it down to us in the form of the Quran. Okay. So when you when you saying the Arabic, the protection is in there. Why? These are the exact words Allah Azza wa said. So now a house that has got Quran recited in it, automatic protection. In fact, if you want to now up your protection, Surah Baqarah, Baqara, right? So Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us that whichever house has got Surah Baqarah in it, then you know you, you you'll be free from from these sort of evil jinn. So people should do that. Now some people are like, well, I can't sit there and read Surah Baqarah because that's quite long. So then I'll tell them, look, at least other ahadith they talk about reading the first five verses Surah Baqarah, reading Ayatul Kursi. Are reading the last two verses of Surah Baqarah, and that's your protection. That's also in a hadith. Mm -hmm. Not only that, you got you got so much other levels of, of, of protection, right? Because Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi had a habit every morning and every evening. He used to say certain adhya. These are the adhkar of of the morning, the dhikr in the morning, the dhikr in the evening. He used to say for protection. So he would recite Qulhu Allahu Ahad three times, Qulaudra bil Falak three times, Qulaudra bil Nas three times every Fajr, every Maghrib. Right? When he used to go to bed, before Rasulullah was going to bed, he used to recite again. Three times, three times, three times, blow in his hands, and then and then pass them all over, all, like that, and pass them all over your body. And right? we know this from the Sunnah. And this gives you protection. Uh, on top of that, you, wanna, you can carry on up in, the, up in the game because after every salah, you can recite uh, Ayatul Kursi, which is in one hadith in Nasai. Which gives you a you know another form of protection. Mm -hmm. uh, like that, there are many things that people should look at. Um, there's a book called The Fortress of the Muslim. You know, it's actually there. we actually have it's it right here. Right it's, a, it's a book that's been there out for for a long time. But, but I mean, people can people can. The thing is, you know that that particular book it's it's actually got a longer version. Yeah. Because the the larger book tells you that exactly what Prophet they do. said. Yes. If you read this, you'll get this. If you read this, you'll get that. So there's a number of things that you can recite in the morning, in the evening, and it ups your protection from from these evils. I guess all this comes back to just having that uh, a wirt or a daily uh, a morning litany where you just recite them every day. My personal favorite, I think, if I don't say this every single day, I actually get a bit scared. I believe there's a hadith that just that ad'iya, that very, very small supplication, three times, yeah. three times will protect you and, and, and many more. But it's I think it's important to, from, yeah. to have that uh, litany of, of different uh, supplications and adhkar that the Prophet ﷺ has sent to us. But also on this topic of, you know, not being scared of jinns and they're just mischievous. And if we just say these adiyat and we say these supplications will be safe. Do you think personally as an imam and as someone who's potentially involved in this area, do you think a lot of the effects or the harmful effects of jinns are exaggerated in our communities? So, um, first of all, it's a tough question. Not, not everything that goes bad in your life is mm. coming from evil eye, jinns, and black magic. Black magic. Not everything that goes wrong because things can go wrong. Sometimes you know? it's your auntie's favorite go-to excuse. Oh, yeah. it's black yeah. magic, evil eye, evil eye. So that, that, that's the thing. So, so from my experience, when people come across and they say that they've got a problem, uh, a person has to assess. Mm -hmm. What is it? Sometimes, look, a third of it is, is from jinn, sihr, and evil eye, and so on. One of the three. But a third of it is is uh, completely just just people's minds believing that it's there but there's nothing there mm. right? paranoia paranoia and a third of it is something medical mental health diagnosis it could be mental health diagnosis it could be a physical ailment something some some pain that i've got i'm thinking well i've got this pain i've got this headache i've got this headache that headache could be because you're not having enough water but that headache could be because you're sitting in the wrong posture the headache could be because you're being exposed to certain i don't know radioactivity waves well, whatever it might be you're right? on your phone for too much is another comment from yeah, probably yeah. our mother's probably tells me. Mm. <laughs> 
So, so for, you know, people need to get get things assessed clearly. And if the doctors usually, if the usually if the doctors can find some, you know, they can diagnose the person with something. Um, it might not be, you know, from this side. Now, there are ways to find out if a person has been affected with this. So, usually, what I tell people is is that, um, and again, it's it's one of these things. If you don't go to an expert, you can't really you can't really judge what what is there. So, if a number of things all come at the same time and you've got these signs there, then there's a high, a high chance that it could be because of one of these things, the sihr, the back magic, or the jinn, and so on. So what are these number of things? So these things are when, when Quran is being recited, then I get affected. I, f- I, feel, I feel the pain. I need to leave. I, I can't uh, listen to this. Yeah, I can't listen to it. Or it's, it's really hurting me. Mm-hmm. Right? So that's only one sign. That's not all of them. Mm-hmm. Right? When the Quran stops, then I, get, then I can feel a bit better. When I sometimes it's the p- patient themselves, when I'm trying to read the Quran, something, something is like stopping me from reading it. When I'm trying to do my salah, something's almost pulling me back. Right? Okay, these are just just again a couple of signs. Another one is what um, I'm getting unwell, specifically like around the time of Maghrib, because Rasulullah said in a hadith that Maghrib is the time when when, when there's a release of Many of these evil shayateen. It's a Sahih Hadith Muslim. So if if there's a kind of an influence of Maghrib, and okay, this is again three signs, but there's got to be more. Which is when I'm sleeping, I'm getting nightmares, right? And these are repeated nightmares of the same kind, right? Not only that, but maybe another sign, which is I'm probably seeing a shadow. You know, I just saw a shadow or I saw something. So sort of, you know, move. Now, again, some of this could be mental. It could be because of mental hallucinations. health. hallucinations. You could have it, schizophrenia. You that's know. it. It could be hallucination. So you need to really see the difference. So now if you go to an e- expert, an expert will be able to tell you in, in you know, different fields what, you know, whether it's uh, a physical uh, problem I have, a mental problem I have, or whether it's actually coming from the jinn or the so and so. The black magic. Uh, the black magic. Do you personally well. take the opinion that a jinn can possess a person? I know there's a difference of opinion <clears> amongst the mashaykh. When it comes to this. So what happens is this, look, I think the, the bottom line is this, because what we know from the from the Quran is nas. We know that a jinn can come and whisper into your mind, and the jinn can, you know, try to tell try to influence you to do certain things or try to think in a certain way. Yeah. So that's what the waswasa is that you know you kind of you feel like yeah 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 I should sort of do that but it's not really you you per se it's the whispering of the shaitan. Now this is what I believe and I think I've I've I've, I've discussed this with others as well and this is like a minimum thing which can give us some kind of understanding of this which is the waswasa can get stronger. Okay? The, the whisperings can get stronger. What that means is this. What we're doing here is, and I think people need to understand this concept. This whole thing is like, let's just say, for example, let's understand it as, as a flu, the common flu. Okay, so someone, someone's got the common flu. Uh, how did they get it? And, and when will they get it? So let's, just, let's take the different variables in, 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 you know, in consideration. It's a very cold day. So the chances of somebody getting flu is going to be higher. Right. It's, it's uh, a person's going outdoors on a very cold day with just a sh- thin T-shirt. The likeliness could be a little more. Now, if the person is young, the likeliness is going to be low. Mm-hmm. If the person is older, the likeliness can be higher. Uh, of them probably even catching pneumonia. Right. Now, let's add a bit more to that. The person's dietary is weak. So the likeliness is going to be higher for them to catch that cold. If a person's dietary is strong or their immune system is strong, generally they've kept it strong, the likeliness can be low of them catching the cold. But if the immune system is weak, the likeliness can be high of them catching that cold and probably fighting it off is going to take them longer. Right? So you can see all these variables are playing, playing uh, at, you know, at the same time. So, so every person can be different in catching that cold right? and how long it will take you to ward it off. Depending on who you are, how fit you are, how your immune system is, you know, where you were, you know, when you cast the court to God, and so on and so forth. Now, the same thing applies to this side. So, would a jinn be able to, or will the waswasa be able to affect you? Well, now it's up to you. How much Quran are you reading? 
How much salah are you doing? Because all that salah that you're offering, the Quran you're doing, it's like that guy whose immune is, you know, system is strong, the his protection. dietary is strong, mm. you understand? He's, he's, he's keeping himself fit, he's young as well. Yeah. All that is the same as you reading Quran, you're doing your salah, you're doing your adhkar, you're, you have got the ma'ayya with Allah. So the likeliness of that waswas or that jinn coming, affecting you is going to be very low. In fact, it's probably not going to have an effect on you. Right? So we see these young guys, right? They go out there jogging, you know, you know on a winter day, uh, or even they walk on a winter day and they're fine with it, right? But there's other people who will just catch it even if they've got so much that they're wearing. Now, now, now let's come back to this thing which, 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 what you asked, which is, if, I'm, if my protection is low, so now, and I'll tell you another thing that, uh, about protection, which is the tahara, the cleanliness. Being in a state of wudu? Mm. No, no. First and foremost is cleaning myself properly when I've used the toilet. A lot of people need to understand that that is a key, key thing to keeping the shayateen and the devils and the jinns away. Because the, the whole thing of istinja that Rasulullah you know, he, he taught us, which is you've you relieved yourself. Now use something to completely clean your, you know, your downstairs. Let's call it downstairs, right? So the water, or in our case is the tissue. In their case, it was mud rocks that they used to use or the water they would use to clean yourself. Now, if you leave any impure thing on your clothes or on your body that is a direct invitation for the devils to be with you why because that unclean thing it 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 goes against your dhikr so now you're doing the dhikr of allah and you recite the quran but that unclean thing is now affecting it right it's not allowing you to have its effect impurity it's because impure is impurity Sheikh, if i can add to that that yeah. also comes in the form i would even take this to the saying even the words that we recite, when when people start cussing, you know, they swear or whatever, maybe or even smoking as well. That or their eyes, everything. Yeah, everything. These things yeah. happen as well. So, so, so this this is the the basic form of of tahara that I'm talking. Now, tahara above that is is other. So, if you got wudu, that's like an extra protection. If you got, if you, uh, especially when you're in najasa, so you know you need to have a ghusl, but you haven't had it. Now you're mm. you're in najasa. You're you're in a state where you're not you're not pure. So Janab. Of instead of Janaba, mm -hmm. so you're not even you're not in a state that you should be recite or you can recite Quran, right? So anyway, so let's say this is again these are things that would give me my immune my, my spiritual immune system mm -hmm. is going to be weak or strong depending on whether I'm practicing these things. It's a very good way to right? put it. Yeah. Okay, so now when the jinn comes or the seher comes or whatever comes, right? Who am I, and what have I been doing? So if I've got all these practices up and I've got my tahara also done, I'm clean. And I'm also doing this adhkar, I'm reciting the Quran. These things are just going to come like a fly to me. You understand? Know Boom, done. You hear me? Move along. Yeah. Just move, nothing's not going to affect me, right? Uh, but if my weakness is there, then these things will affect me, yeah. right? Or they can affect me. I think it's becoming a common occurrence. We've seen many videos actually go viral of soothsayers, magicians actually come out and say, look, we can do magic on, you know, you know, atheists, different religions, but they go, when it comes to a Muslim, there's like a block, mm -hmm. there's a barrier. We, we don't know how to get through. And we can play the videos. Like it's, there's actually like yeah, yeah. true true stories coming out. We've of, all of been searching on that two or three o'clock in the morning yeah. YouTube feed of yeah. jinn stories. Oh, <laughs> right. So now let's get back to your question, which is, can a jinn actually possess them and take them out, take over them? What I think the minimum thing is, is that waswasa that comes, the whispering that comes, if your protection is down, you, you're not reading Quran, you're, you're, you're barely you know, doing salah or whatever, or you're, you're not practicing Islam well, or somehow you're weak, in some ways you're weak. And another part of this is very, very, very important, is your willpower. Please, please make sure that this comes like almost on top of everything else, which is the human willpower. So if you have your willpower, even when you're ill, you have your willpower. Let's say someone's physically ill. Their willpower, this, this is, this is, proven scientifically as well, which is part of a person healing is their willpower to be healed, right? So when you inside say, no, I'm gonna get better, I'm gonna, and you have your willpower to get better, to get stronger, it helps you, definitely has an effect on you. If you give up on your willpower, then you Negative can- Negative energy can kill you. Can yeah, kill you. yeah, you, you lose a lot, you lose a massive part of you of, of getting better. Now, let's bring it back to what we're discussing, which is now the shayateen or the, or the devils or the jinns, right? If, this, is, this is an absolute fact. If you got strong willpower and you're not scared of them, 100% they're scared of you. But if you drop that and your willpower is weak and you, oh God, I'm scared. The fact that you're doing that gives them the chance to be a bit more mischievous. 
So the one thing that you need to do also, apart from all the tahara and the cleanliness and the reading I said, is that keep your willpower strong. And what you want to focus is, don't focus on the jinn. Don't focus on the jinn. Focus on Allah, the fact that Allah is watching you. Focus on the fact that you've read the Quran. So if I give you, if I if I say this to you, I say if I say to you, don't. There's actually a book about it. Don't think of a pink elephant. What are you thinking of? Pink elephants. You think of a pink elephant. <laughs> so if I say to, if I say to, don't think of a jinn, what they're gonna do? Think of jinn. They're gonna think of jinn. So yeah. instead of that, what you should do is you should think of the Quran. Just positively, just think on the Quran. Think of the angels. Because Allah has said in, in Surah Tariq, in kullu nafsi lamma alayha hafiz. Every human has a guarding, guarding angel that protects you. Think of that. Allah sent that to you for your protection. Think Allah is watching me. Think that these things are effective. They're gonna, this is your willpower. That it's going gonna, it's gonna to work. Your yaqeen, your, 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 your conviction. Now what that then does is that the, the waswasa gets reduced. Now if the waswasa becomes so much, this is the point I was going to try to make. If the wasps become so much that now it's getting stronger and stronger and stronger and, and they're finding space now to get here because I'm not even thinking of Allah. I'm not doing the dhikr of Allah. I'm not doing salah. I'm not, you know, I'm far away from that. And I'm also not clean and so on. Now the wasps become so strong, it's so strong that I can't even hear myself. You understand? The, 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 the whispers, these whispers yeah. are, 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 are in my mind. Me. Right? So it consumes them. So that's what I would say is probably the, the minimum level that you know, Raqis or ulama across the world, scholars and that would would accept that that's that's at least something that happens in the process where what you might call the person being possessed. I think you've mentioned quite a lot there, Sheikh. But I'm going to try and come in and try and spin this a little bit. Yeah, we've on. talked about um, the importance of having like a weird, for example. Sure, we have you know an ocean of litanies. Hezbollah Baha comes to mind, and the word of Imam Nawawi. But also, I guess we could also add that you know keeping the company of the righteous as well. I would argue. What are the benefits of keeping, um, you know, faithful companions, and what benefits does it does it bring? Uh, something that comes to my mind, and there's a great poem by I think it was Sidi Abu Madian. You know, if people and what he's trying to say in this poem is that you know, if people understand the sweetness that it brings to sit with the fuqara, to sit with the inheritors of knowledge, the people of wisdom. But my question would be, what benefits are there in sitting with the people of? Okay, so let's let's fuqara? make this broader now. Yeah. If you are sitting with a person who's reading Quran or a person who reads the Quran daily, who does his salah, right? There's something, there's something special in the ghaib, in the unseen about that person. Because the fact that they're there, they have an effect on you. If you sit with a person who's a sinner, who's disobedient to Allah, there's almost like this there's zulumat, there's a darkness that, that, that's coming from them. There's nur and light coming from a person who, I'm talking about from the ghaib. Yeah. I'm not talking about something that we can see. But sometimes you can see, I think, even if it's the one who prays Fajr, I think you can see like there's a glow. On there's the, a, there's, so that glow is yeah. something that Allah says, see mahum fi wujuhihim, right? There's, there's a kind of a sign in the face of a person who prays and a person who doesn't pray. Okay, so there's a person here who's now a person who's practicing Islam. Yeah. One person. There's a second. There's a third. There's a fourth. They all have... No, because they're like that, shayat, look, the shaitan or the devil is far away from them. The shaitan can't come to this person a lot because of the fact that they're doing so much zikr, so much tilawat Qur'an, they're reciting Qur'an, they're doing salah. Same as this person, same as that person, same as... Now, I'm a person amongst them. Now, shaitan can't come close to him that much. I can't come close to him, but I'm in the midst of them. What's going to happen? I'm going to get some automatic kind of, you know, it's a, some effects of some kind of protection, right? So, some form. Now, the same thing happens with the house. A house with the dhikr of Allah, a house with tilawa being recited, a house with Quran, a house of salihin and the righteous. It has an extra inbuilt system of protection in there. Somehow, we don't see this, but it's in the ghaib, right? Now, what happens uh, when a person comes to a masjid? You come to a masjid where, where constantly people are doing sujood, they're, they're praying there. There's a, there's a kind of a, uh, there's a lot of, lot of angels that visit that place, you understand? Because when, you, when, you're, when you're praying, when you're doing tilawah, angels are frequently coming. I mean, the hadith in Sahih Muslim is there that no nation will get, or no group of people will get together in the house of Allah and they will start doing a dars or the less, they, they, they start now teaching the book or learning from the book of Allah, except hafat bihum malaika. The angel will come surround them, right? So the angel's presence is a lot in the masjids. Now, when I'm in there, there's, there's you know, with, amongst those people, there's an extra... Uh, uh, element of protection that, that I'm, I'm, I'm in and usually you'll see the person who's affected by jinn or sihr they find it difficult to walk in these places they come there they get 
you know, they, they get pulled back or they start to faint or they have an act. Why? Because the shaitan wants to stop them from going into those places. So, so what you've just asked is exactly what we need, which is we need the company of the righteous. We need the company of those places where Allah's words is mentioned and the ibadah is done. We need that. We've spoken a lot about protection, divine protection, gaining the protection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala from corrupt forces, from evil forces, from the shayateen, from the jinn. We've spoken a little bit about black magic as well. The ultimate protection, in my eyes, is to be someone who is a close friend of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, a wali of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How does one use all that we've mentioned today to become a wali of Allah? How can one get into that closeness with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to have the ultimate form of protection? You know, somebody asked, um, somebody asked, I think he was um, Imam Ahmad ibn Hanbal rahimahullah. What's the distance between the earth and the arsh of the Rahman, the throne of Allah? What's the difference? And he said, Da'wa sadiqa min qalbin sadiq. He said, An honest call from a pure heart. That's the difference between the earth and Allah's throne, which is, you know, the, the, one of the greatest creations of Allah Azza wa Jal, right? Above the seven heavens and the seven earth. What does that mean? The closeness of Allah Azza wa Jal comes from here, right? It's, it's within us. It's me opening my mind to Allah. It's all, you know what I said to you in the beginning, which is dhikr is, every, is in every single form of ibadah. When I'm in my salah, and I'm able to do what the Quran said to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam in Surah Muzammil: "Tabattal ilayhi tabtila, cut yourself off of everything except for Him." That is the closest. That is the closeness you feel. You can't get closer than that. In the Hadith of uh, Sahih Muslim, it says, "Aqrabu ma yakunu al-abd," that the closest a human can get to Allah is when they're in sujood, when they're in prostration. It's in the mind. That close to business. Allah will open His closeness to us when we're able to free ourselves from the from our surroundings and the world, especially when we're worshiping Him, and we're trying to get. So whether it's me opening the Quran reading, whether it's me making du'a, the fact that I'm thinking of nothing but Allah, Allah in my du'a, the fact that when I'm reciting the Quran, I'm doing it for Allah's sake, and I'm reading for His, I'm reading His words to Him because He wants to hear me say His words to Him. Now let me give you another explanation of how that works. It's like, it's like when you when you have a I'm not uh, you know I'm just giving this example as humans to humans so that we can understand and we'll bring it back to. When you've got someone that you love, human to human, I'm talking about. When you love someone, what do you do? You remember them a lot. You even say their name a lot. You talk about them. You talk about them, and it makes you feel happy. You talk to them. You talk to them. But even if they're not there, let's say they're not there, you talk about them. You talk about the times you had with them. You talk about wanting to be with them. You talk about them as a, as a character, as a person, how they make you feel and all that, right? So that's when you're in love with someone, right? Now think about you and Allah. If you're, if you're in love with Allah, as in you love Allah Azza wa Jal, you love Allah Azza wa Jal, you want to spend time with Him. That's in your salah. This is, you know, once I remember this, and this, this is really striking, right? Uh, I was in a, uh, in London, I was in a um, printing press. And it's a non-Muslim printing press. And I, and I said to the, to, to, the, to the guy in the office, you know, time for Asr came. And I'm like, oh my God, I've got to read my Asr. So, you know, we're, we're in the middle of a whole conversation with trying to get some printing done. I said, can you excuse me for a while? I really need to do my prayers. And he said, yeah, yeah, yeah. He said, it's fine, fine. I said, what do you want to do? I said, I can do it here, right, right here. He said, look, the, the, the office next to me, there's a glass window in between. The two offices, said, just do it there. So I stood there, I did my Asr prayers there. And he watched me. There's a non-Muslim watching me. After I finished, I came back. And you know, the first thing he said to me, he said, Hassan, he goes, that was like a meditation, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. Now look at how a non-Muslim looks at us when we're in Salah. And that's what we're supposed to do. We're in a meditation. We're supposed to be in a munajat. That you're having a, a secret conversation with Allah. In, in your salah, this is your one your moment with Allah. When you're in that, 
you are you are now going uh, you know, in the ranks in the ranks of the closeness to Allah. And the closeness to Allah is darajat. There are many, 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 many levels of getting close to Allah. And each time we do these things, when we cut ourselves off from other thoughts except just for Allah, each time I'm, I do the dhikr of Allah, I'm remembering Allah, I'm saying His words because we we, we love Allah, right? I'm saying your Quran, your words. I want to repeat them back to you because I love you, right? When you're doing that, what what's happening? You are now going above the ranks of wilaya. And you're becoming slowly the wali of Allah. And the wali of Allah is not just one rank. There are several ranks. So they say the, the uh, adna wali, the, the one who is the lowest wali of Allah, as, as in one who's close to Allah, is the one who does the five daily prayers. Right? The constant, like, I'm not going to miss those daily, daily prayers. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do them on time. And I'm going to do them with devotion. Do the, that's, the, that's the minimum one who's close to Allah. And then above that, of course, we've got many others. Allah wali ladina amanu. Those who believe. And then I also say, mm. Because Allah is close to you, He takes you out of darkness, puts you into light. I think our teachers, you know, say a lot that the whole point to have a faith, you know, the hallmark of a faith is to have like a, a saint, if you will, or a wali. Um, and it's not to say that you can't be like that, but it's to show you that you can achieve having that close connection and proximity to Allah. You can become a wali. You can become a wali. You can become a wali. Um, you know, we heard from before, even even the drunk man to recall a previous podcast with one of our beloved Sheikh, Sheikh Ninui, he came on. Um, SubhanAllah. Sheikh, forgive me for this. I want to ask you one last question. And this is if you're comfortable. Yeah, go on, go ahead. Your craziest jinn story you've ever heard. <laughs> no, so no, no. become a willy of Allah. Now you just have to <laughs> take No, nah, the thing is, your, your viewers, the thing is, look, I've, I've, got, I've got lectures on the internet with uh, those stories there, uh -huh. but they're not for everyone. Mm-hmm. Some people get really scared with mm. with with the gin story or with with that. If you do get scared, please. You can you can skip this. No, but I, I can. No, but, but then, but then I, I, there's, there's so many. And you're as you're asking for the scariest one. Not the scariest. Not scared, oh, just one. It could be one. Maybe just no, one. No, but I, let me talk about a good. Let me talk about a good one. Okay, go for a good. One. Is this with a possessed individual? No, like, no. Let, let me give you a good gin story. So we've got, we've got we don't so hear many. this. We don't hear this often. Though, do That's we, what I'm saying. So, so we, I don't want to talk. I don't want on your uh, podcast. Can I don't you, want to can you to verify you. the story? Like we need something 100. percent It's me. Okay. <laughs> okay. With that. okay. Right. We're it's happy me. to listen. <laughs> so, so I traveled traveled to India. Um, this was in 2016. Was it 2016? Yeah. So I went for Ertakaf in a masjid in Delhi. It was just me and this other brother, and it was by the it's by the uh, the place where Shaw, Imam Shawulila Rahimullah is buried. So this masjid is is literally is, is surrounded like surrounded by a graveyard, right? Now it's a small masjid, but it's it's so spiritual. I spent the full ten days there, and you know, like you're sitting there in the night. This is at the kaf time. It was the last ten days of Ramadan. You're sitting there, and I'm trying to do some ibadah, and then I just lie down. And then what happens? You just sleep, all right? You sleep. And suhoor is going to be at 3.30, like end of end of suhoor is 3.30. So adhan of fajr is going to go off after that. And I'm, I'm knocked out in the, in, the, in the masjid. And this would happen pretty much, I think, for the, for the last 10 nights, right? It happens because you get a bit tired, you lie down, you're not, next to you're knocked out. I kid you not, there used to be something, something used to wake me up for suhoor. And he used to grab my toe and shake my toe. There's nothing there. The other brother is in the corner. He's asleep. I, when I wake up, I'm nothing there. But somebody just grabbed my toe and just woke me up. This is a good jinn believer waking me up for suhoor so that I don't miss the suhoor. Then I would get up and I would do my suhoor. And every morning, I'd say, I'd say out of the seven, out of the ten nights, at least seven nights, he shook my toe and Could he it have been an insect or something? <laughs> there's no, an insect that, this that, this is my no, toe, right? To this is my toe. Look, this is my toe, yeah. And I mean, there's India. Like, like, <laughs> if it's a spirit, if it's a spirit, like, did, did, can it take a form? Like, does it take a The thing form? is, look, in the same masjid, I, I, I would, I would, the thing is, uh, okay, you can call me possessed, you can start saying I'm no, possessed, no. but I'm not. It's the only, only place where I'm hearing it. So, I'm in the masjid and I'm trying to so I do some dhikr or something in the masjid. And I'm hearing dhikr in the background. Allah. So it's a small masjid, right? Small masjid. And I can clearly hear at least two different voices coming from the back of the masjid. 
and they're doing the dhikr of Allah. And I can hear, and I can hear that and night after night. I mean, but I didn't bother because they're the believing jinns. And they love, they love human beings that are in this dhikr, in tilawa, and they will try and be good to you. And I'm giving, trying to give you a good example of a, yeah. of, of, of a jinn so story. So you don't need right? to be scared from jinns? No, they help you when, when, you know, when time comes, like brothers, you know, they, they'll help you, no problem. Don't, don't worry about it. Sheikh, it's been an absolute honor and privilege to have you here. Thank you so much for joining us. And to the audience at home, thank you for tuning in and listening. If you enjoy this video, please do like the video, subscribe to our content, and even turn the bell on for notifications. And leave a comment below of something that you may have learned or perhaps get, maybe share your own little gin story. Keep it PG and friendly over here. Maybe it's a good one like we heard from the Sheikh over here. Also on a note that these podcasts are available on Apple, Google, and Spotify. Sheikh, any last words, final remarks? The, the only final remark that I can say is that um, a person needs to focus a lot on what, what has Allah said in the Holy Quran. Ya ayyuhalladheena amanu dhkurullaha dhikran kathira. O you who believe, remember Allah. And then Allah says dhikran kathira. Remember him abundantly. Wasabbihuhu bukratan wa asila. And also glorify him in the morning and the evening. Right? Basically stay in the dhikr of Allah as much as you can. The final words that I will say that the hadith in Tirmidhi that tells us that every person who is about to walk into Jannah, before they walk into Jannah, they're going to have a regret. And that regret is, I wish I had done more dhikr of Allah in the world. Because of the things that they're going to see in the could of God in Jannah, they're going, to, they're going to have that regret. So dhikr of Allah gives us protection. It makes us close to Allah. It makes, makes us um, have that ma'i and that, that you know, the, 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 not only the protection, but it gives us that, that way of uh, knowing that we, we can be in this world and we have got Allah with us. Right? We've got Allah with us. And only that, only that you can look forward to having a good life in the next world as well. And all of that. And it's not, again, it's not just dhikr as in tasbih on your fingers. Dhikr is when I remember Allah whilst reading the Quran, whilst in salah, whilst doing tasbih, while in dua. All these things are the remembrance. When my mind connects up with Allah. Beautiful. I think that was, uh, couldn't put it any better myself. Jazakum Sheikh. And Hayakum Allah. Jazakum. Jazakum. Thank you.